what's taking place next within our life. We've all been on that journey. We've all gone someplace, and we've all done certain things. And, and the first week we talked about where are we where in, in life, where are we? Before we could understand where we are, we had to decide where we came from. And the circumstances and the issues of our past determined where we are. Today we're going to talk about why can't we stay where we are? Why, why is it that it seems like we always are ebb and flow and moving, that we're never the same, we never are satisfied, we are always moving. We like where we are in some cases, we enjoy what we do in some cases, but the ebb and flow of life, we are always moving. Aren't you glad you're not stuck in the first job that you had? So aren't you glad you're not stuck in that relationship that you were in? Aren't you glad you're not stuck on the paycheck that you used to get? In every area of our life, we like to be moving. We cannot be satisfied or settled for things that are of the past. There's times where we have to say, I know where I am. I know exactly where I am. I could get anybody to where I am. But sometimes, God wants to get into our boat. And he wants to rock our world because that is the only way some of us will ever move. Some people, some people hate change. Anybody in here hate change? You probably wouldn't be at Glenville very long if you hated too much change. But I think it's very important that we understand change is good. It is very important. God doesn't bring us to a place to leave us in that place. God puts us in a place to make us who he wants to be so we can move out of that place. So we can be somebody for his honor and for his good. We are here. And we understand how we got here. Some of us do not like our past. Some of us say, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I would have never been there. I wish I'd have never said that. I wish I'd have never done those things in my past. But you know what? We did. We are. And we are here. What do we do with what we did? We have to bury that into the blood of Jesus Christ and say, that is in my past. I am moving forward. And I am here for a purpose. And that purpose is not to be satisfied it's not to be complacent. It's not to be stagnant. It's to say, I am learning today what God wants me to do tomorrow. If we ever decide, I'm happy, I'm satisfied, I'm content, I am where I want to be for the rest of my life, in spiritual life or in financial situations or in relationships, what we have done, we just clicked it on cruise control. We are happy, content, and satisfied. God, don't bother me. God, let me do what I want to do. And that irritates God. Because God, when he gets into our boat, he is challenging us. He is rocking our boat for a, re for a reason. He wants us to do something better tomorrow. Whether you're 25 years old or whether you're 75 years old, God still has a plan. And that plan can only be arrived when we look at God and we say, okay, God, I want you in my boat. When he got into our boat, he didn't just save us. He came in to take over us. He died on the cross. He paid the price for your salvation and paid the price for your life. And now what we're saying is, okay, God, you're in my boat. What do we do? What do we do? You know, we all have a story. We could take our story our personal story, or we could even take our church story, and we can look at how God has orchestrated within our life. We can look at what God is doing and how God put us in this situation. I want to share you a brief story about my life. When, uh, when I was out of college, uh, my first ministry responsibility was in a, in a church in Paris, Texas called Ramser Baptist Church. And, uh, we were there for about five years. And while we, we were there for five years, a lot of things took place. I was working part-time at that church. I was managing a Goodyear store and working part-time at the church. And, and as I was working part-time at the church, the church had, we probably had 10 to 15 kids in the youth department. And, and I was working all day and all night, and we do all kinds of things with the kids at night. And um, over the la next year or so, um, we started having 50, 60, 70, 80 kids 
come to the youth department, and, and they were hanging out at the Goodyear store, and the owner of the store would come in and say, dude, you can't have all these kids hanging out here. I said, well, maybe it's free labor. So I, the pastor came up to me at the time, and he said, uh, he said, Bruce, I'd like to put you on full-time. And I said, dude, you, you can't put me on full-time because I, I was making good money working at the, managing the Goodyear store. And he goes, no, whatever you make, I'm going to match. I said, mm. I didn't want to do ministry. I, I didn't mind doing it part-time, but that was really not, I didn't have the leadership skills. I didn't really have the abilities, and, but I, 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 I gave in. I said, okay. I was there for five years. From there, we moved to uh, Midway Baptist Church in Aubrey, Texas, and I was the youth pastor there for three years, and I had a blind pastor, a blind pastor that I picked up every morning at 8.30 in the morning, we took him to the office from 8.30 to 12 o'clock every morning, four hours a day. I was in his office. I was reading the Bible. I was teaching. We were talking. We were doing all kinds of notes. I learned how to study four hours a day for four years with a blind pastor. And I love that man today. He was a great communicator. He was a trickster, but he was a great communicator. Uh, I could tell you some stories. Whenever you hang out with a blind pastor and he tricks you, you know you're going to get tricked a little bit. i got some stories to tell, but just never let me take you to Love Field and tell you where the bathroom is if you're a blind pastor. Just let, just, I may get messed up a little bit of where you should go. Anyway, after Midway, uh, I went to Arlington, Texas, and I was the uh, youth pastor and Christian school chaplain in Arlington, Texas for two years. And from Arlington, Texas, I moved to Seminole Baptist Temple in Springfield, Missouri for a few years. In every one of those stops, God stretched me and taught me great and mighty and valuable lessons. I could have said, you know what, I've got this youth pastor thing down. Look how good I was. But in every area of my, my, my ministry, he took me from here to here to here, and he taught me and he grew me. And he gave me the abilities to do what I needed to do. I was scared. The biggest fear that I moved, we moved from Arlington, Texas, to Seminole Baptist Temple in Springfield, Missouri, a multi-million dollar campus. And I moved from a youth pastor one day to the assistant pastor the very next day. And I walked into that office and I said, what do I do? I, I don't hang out with kids. And he brought in all the financials. He brought in all the class teachers. He said, your job is to make sure we stay on budget. Your job is to make sure all the Sunday school ministries are ran. Your job is to make sure that if I don't like something, you fix it. <laughs> I said, wow. I walked in that door, and I had 50 people hate my guts in the first five minutes. That's where I learned, you know what, you can't take it personal when people don't like you. Because in every area of ministry, somebody doesn't like you. I could have stayed there. I was content, satisfied, and happy until you called. Glenville called. My resume was in the trash, and then you picked it out of the trash, and you called me to be the pastor. Unqualified, ignorant, fearful. I walked into these doors. 17 years ago. And that was the biggest change in my life. But let me, what I, let me tell you what I found out. You needed me as much as I needed you. Glenville, at that time, was a very hurting, struggling church. You guys have gone through some major calamities with pastors. You guys were hurt. And I thought I was going to come in and show you how good I was. I'm going to organize. I'm going to structure. I'm going to make this thing. I'm going to run this church like a well-oiled machine, and we're going to be running thousands in a few years. Well, I came into a church that the people were beat up, hurt, struggling, couldn't pay the bills, had debt out their ears, had no idea what to do and how to do it. So we were a perfect match, because I really didn't know what to do either. That first year, when my plans were to come into this church and to build 
a church. My first year, my plan was to love the people. Wrap my arms around them. Talk about the future. Talk about the problems that we have. Let's not put our head in the sand. But let's deal with what we have to deal with and move on to the future. Every step of our life, whether it's corporate or personal, God has a plan and he has a way through that plan. We walked into the first business meeting. It was right after I got here. And uh, we had 40 acres of land out on 47th and Rock Road. 40 acres of land. They had $100,000 worth of work done on that acreage of land. We had a gymnasium right over here that we still owe $200,000 on. We had land out there that was paid for. We had a $200,000 debt here at the church, and we couldn't pay staff. We couldn't even do ministry. We were struggling to keep the doors open. The view or the vision of the church was to get out of this area and move to 47th and Rock. That was the plan. This is where we are, where we are going. We had to sit down with the membership of the church and say, guys, I think we need to readjust center on the vision of the church. So we sat down in front of the entire church and we said, guys, I think we need to sell. We need to sell the land. Some people didn't like that. And I think we ought to take the money that we sell off the land, we ought to pay off our debts. We have to be zero debt. God cannot bless us into the future if we are living in the past debt. If we have something and we couldn't afford to build out there if we wanted to. So we got up and we talked to the church and we sold the land and we paid off our debts. And for the first time in a long time, the church had zero debt. And then we were in this little auditorium over here right behind us. We've been in that, in that little auditorium for years. And it was packed. And I said, guys, since we're not moving out there, let's build here. Some of the people thought, you know what, let's move out to the highways. And some of the people said, let's stay where the people are here in South Wichita. So we decided that we were going to stay here in South Wichita, and we were going to build this building. And we got this building, and it cost us some two point. Five million dollars. I can't even say it. it hurts my feelings just to say two point five million dollars. Can you say sixteen thousand dollars a month payment? So we built the building. We voted to build the building. We made the commit commitments to build the building. And y you know what? Um, where we were in complacency to where we are, head over water with our payments and with this building. Here's what God did, though. God started blessing us, started loving us, started helping us. Oh, we had some bumps and bruises along the way. But the sweetest thing about what God did for us is he built a church that reaches people for Jesus Christ. Do we have a problem? Yeah, we have a problem. Yeah, we have a financial problem. We need more people. We have to have more resources in order to do what God wants us to do. We're not here to make a building payment. We're here to reach people for Jesus Christ. We're here to use the facilities that God has given to us to change the world. But when God gets in our boat and he wants us to change, he takes us from where we are, our circumstances that we are in, and he does something that we can't do on our own. He wants us to be so far over our head that where he wants us to go, we can't do it. We have to get on our knees before God and say, God, I need you. God is good, but God wants to be tested. He wants us to test him. What does that mean? He doesn't want us to stay where we are. He doesn't want to be known as a complacent God. God has you here for a reason, but God has a plan for you to go tomorrow to a new destination. So let me give you the three points. The first is Jesus is in our boat. Take this in two different ways. He is in your boat. He is in your life. He is in the church's world, in the church's life. He is in our boat. And when Jesus gets in our boat, in other words, when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, or when you give your life to Jesus Christ, he gets in your boat, and he's going to ask you to do some things. Go a little deeper. Cast out your nets. 
He is not going to let you get saved, come to church and be satisfied. He wants you to do something. Cast out a little deeper into the water and throw your nets over. And when you throw your life over and into his hands, he can do great and mighty things with you. But as long as you're sitting on the shore, as long as you're mending your nets, as long as you're praising Jesus, as long as you're doing the complacency, you're not getting in deep water. You're not going to catch any fish. When Jesus gets in your boat, he says, do something. Don't be complacent. Don't be satisfied. You can be content in what you do, but you cannot get complacent. Anytime, any area of your life we get complacent in, it stagnates. Amen? Anybody married? If you get complacent, what happens? It falls apart. What happens when it gets complacent and you don't do anything about it? it? Falls apart. What happens when you get complacent and your eyes are opened? Things can change. I have a young couple that I had the privilege of. They've been coming to the church here for three months. They came to the church here the first Sunday. They were on the verge of divorce. Breakup out. She left him. It was not pretty. They met with me out in the center out here. And they said, Bruce, we, we need to talk. We need to talk. They came into my office that very next week, and we sat down with them, and we talked and, about what God is doing within their life and what they need to do. And we sat with three or four different sessions and talked about different things within their life and how God is starting to work within their life and how to mend some, fin, fin, mend some issues within their life. We gave them some tools. Those tools changed from complacency to interaction. Here's the greatest thing. Three months down the road, a couple that comes to the church ready to split up, comes to the office, gets tools for their marriage relationship. Doing good. They go to their house one night after work, and their neighbor says, Hey, uh, Mitch, I need to talk to you. Oh, man, my, we're, having, we're having a hard time. Can you guys come over and talk to us? And they took the tools that they used to put into place to fix their marriage. They gave those same tools to a couple to help them in their marriage. They could have, amen. They could have, I give up. I quit. I'm tired of it. But when Jesus got in their boat, he rocked their world. They had to do something, and they didn't want to give it up. They said, we're going to work on it. They got the tools, and when they got the tools, they applied them to their life. Somebody saw what they had and said, I need what you have and they gave them the tools in order to change their life. That is success. That is, I'm not staying in my complacency. I'm not staying right where I am. I'm going to learn. I'm going to change. And I'm going to do something great for the cause of Jesus Christ. When he is in your boat, God is trying to tell you something. In order to listen, we need to be open and sensitive to the message. Often things that happen are not simply by coincidence. Here are a few ways God might try to tell you something when he's rocking your boat. Good points here if you want to take some notes. The central focus of our faith is the belief that God has entered into a conversation with us. The challenge is to be open to what God is trying to say to us. When our boat is getting rocked, why is it getting rocked? Anybody can sail on a calm day in the middle of the lake. Anybody could do that. But in reality, our life is not on a calm day in the middle of the lake. In most of our life, we have a lot of wind, a lot of waves, and our boats rock a whole lot of times. And what we have to honestly say is, why? What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to tell me? If you don't feel the peace about something, there may be a message in the turmoil. If you don't feel a peace about something, there may be a message in the turmoil. If you do feel a peace, there could be a message in that too. 
I'm not saying that everything that we do is wrong. But I'm saying whether we have turmoil or you have peace, we may have to see, God, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to tell me? To be complacent, to be satisfied, to be content? Or if there's turmoil, what am I doing in order to cause the problem? A similar idea themes up and shows up. If a similar problem or a theme keeps showing up, perhaps there's something that we need to learn. If Jesus is rocking our boat and our boat continues to rock and we continue to live in the boat and we don't do anything about the rocking boat, that boat is going to capsize. We have to say, what do I need to learn? If a door is closed in some other area of your life, perhaps there's something better or different on the horizon. When the boat is rocking, we just can't ignore it. If God's rocking the boat, God is not afraid of your future. God wants to give you something in your future. My challenge to this week is pay attention to the messages that repeatedly show up within your life. Repeatedly show up within your life. Peter was sitting on the shore with his buddies, mending his net. Jesus comes walking up with the crowd of people, talking to them, masses of crowds of people. And he looked over at Peter and said, Peter, I need to borrow your boat. <laughs> Peter said, dude, okay. I just cleaned the stinking boat. I'm mending my nets. But okay. Got in the boat and he started teaching. Peter got something that not everybody else even saw or recognized. Peter got into the same boat that Jesus got into. And then he said, cast out a little further. Jesus was getting ready to do something for Peter that the other guys were going to witness. But Jesus is going to give Peter an opportunity to experience. Cast your nets in the water. Cast your nets in the water. Peter said, oh, come on, dude. I've been out all night. I just got them fixed. I know what I'm doing. You don't. Jesus said, I'm going to rock your boat. Cast them. And the fish came in to the net so much that they began to break, and he brought another boat in, and they began to sink. I'm telling you that if you do what God tells you to do, your nets can break. The blessing of God upon your life, not necessarily financial, but it could be relational, and it could be in any area of your life. When Jesus gets into your boat and he tells you to do something, and you do what he asks you to do, you listen to his words, he can bless you like you've never been blessed before. He can do things for you that he could never do until you asked him, until you did what he asked you to do. Then they got back to the shore. Do you know what they did? They said they forsook all. And followed him. These guys are fishermen. How they made their money is to do what? Fish. Jesus gave them the greatest catch that they've ever seen. The boats were full. The nets broke. They went back to the shore. And they said, forget about the fish. I'm going to follow Jesus. When it says they forsook they said, Jesus got my attention. He rocked my boat. He is going to do something greater than I could possibly even think, imagine, or dream about. When Jesus spoke, he saw the power. We got to see the power of God when Jesus spoke. God wants to rock our boat in a way that's going to wake us up. Now, your boat and my boat are two totally different boats. What rocks my boat may not rock your boat. The thing that he wants to wake you up, it may not wake me up. But God knows where you are. And he knows where you were. And he knows where he wants to take you. We have to allow Jesus to get in the boat. And when Jesus gets in the boat, I don't care where you are. You just say, okay, Lord, where do you want me to go? How do you want me to go? I want to learn from you. And then once we get in the boat, and Jesus is in the boat, here's the biggest point that you could ever have. God's plans are bigger than your plans. God's plans 
man, I could think about what I want. I could think about what I could dream and aspire to be. But my plans, they're nothing compared to what God can do. God never gets it wrong. He doesn't swing and miss. Every detail of our day comes through the blueprints of the meticulous care for us. And even when all hope seems lost, remember, he is the one who is in control. When you feel like it's done, out of here, done, it is just starting when you allow God to take over. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my way, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We can't give up. We can't settle. We can't be satisfied. We can't be complacent. We cannot just be content. We have to say, my ways are better. I can do things through Christ. We have to remember, Jesus wants in your life. He wants to rock your boat. And he wants you to know that what he can do through you and for you is greater than what you could do in any area. Not only is God flawlessly at work for your good, he does not let loose until he is finished. God's providence never dries up or fizzles out. It is always in action to accomplish its intended aim. Everything he does is right, and it's all right all the time until he's done. You may get tired of it. You may be saying, why is he rocking my boat? Well, you maybe need to quit fighting him rocking your boat. Maybe he wants to go this direction, and you're wanting to go this direction, and his ways is better than yours. He's more powerful than you are. He can do things that you can never possibly imagine. The power of Jesus. When Jesus got into the boat and cast off, and he said, Peter, cast in right here. Peter witnessed the greatest miracle or his first miracle that he ever witnessed was Jesus made the boats full of fish. He understood the power that he was in. God's plans are bigger and better than we could ever possibly imagine. God's plan for Peter is the bigger than what he ever could imagine. Do you ever, ever think that uh, if Peter didn't get in the boat, what was, gonna, what was Peter going to be? He was going to be a fisherman. But since Peter got in the boat and he did what Jesus asked him to do, what is Peter now? He's a disciple, a writer of the Bible. There's more names after Peter or the gospel authors than any other names because Peter followed what Jesus asked him to do. He's not just a fisherman. Jesus didn't come there so he could make him a better fisherman. He didn't sit there so he could build up a fishing camp so people could come to him so he could teach him how to fish. Jesus says, no, I don't care about you fishing. It's not about the fish. It's about what you're going to do. I'm going to use you to capture the world for Jesus Christ. In Philippians 3.12, Paul said this, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold for that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. In other words, I am not done. I am an old man, but I'm going to continue to fight. I'm going to continue to do what I'm supposed to do until Jesus comes back. Until I close my eyes, I'm going to press on. I'm going to move on. Because here's the reason. The kingdom of God is constantly moving. The kingdom of God is constantly moving. I kind of rag on churches a little bit, but have you ever been to a church that hasn't moved? As you're a kid, you go to church, and back in 1960s, 70s, you go to this church, and you go back to 2015, and it's the same songs, the same look, the same paint, the same baptism, probably the same preacher, and the only thing is different is the people turn from brown hair to gray hair. It's the only difference, because the church is identical. There's nothing wrong with churches. The problem is 
Churches have a purpose, and that purpose is to reach people for the cause of Jesus Christ. And if our churches are not reaching people for the cause of Jesus Christ, we lose this point. The kingdom of God is constantly moving. People are the priority. Jesus died on the cross not for us to be satisfied in church. Jesus died on the cross to bring people into the saving knowledge of Christ. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets were breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats, so they began to break. The guy sitting on the sideline, they said, get into the game. Get into the game. Let God bless you. Get into the game and see what God can do. Whenever we become complacent, we would say, you've got this. Why don't you take two trips? I'll take two Sessions in the nursery this month. I'll work in the youth department all five weeks this month. I'll be on the praise team all five weeks. Why do you have to do it? Well, really, because nobody else will do it. Everybody else is sitting on the sideline mending their fish, their nets, and Peter's the only one doing the work in the boat. But Peter, thank you. Why don't you bring the fish back to us? I'll be glad to eat the fish. I just don't want to work. For the fish. Guys, come out and help! I need your help! You know what they did? They got back into their boats and they got out to where the fish were and they were blessed by God because they got off the sidelines. And church, if we stay on the sideline, we are going to be a contented, fat, and happy church, but we will not be blessed by God. What we need to do what I have to do personally and what we have to do corporately is we have to say, you know what? My nets are bended. I've done everything I need to do. I'm going to get my nets, I'm going to put them back in the boat, and I'm going to say, God, where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to serve? Yeah, I could do preschool. I could do praise team. I could do band. I could do greeters ministry. I can do something. Get into the game. Because if we sit on the sideline and we mend our nets, and we enjoy the show, we have become a complacent, dead church. And when we become a dead, complacent church, what happens to our own personal life? Let me tell you. When we go to church, and all we do is get upset that somebody else is doing something differently the way that you would do it, you want amen? What happens? We become bitter, unsatisfied, and inwardly die. We just die. What well, Jesus is saying, guys, I saved you for a purpose. There's a bigger plan. Mend your nets. Get into the boat. And let me do something great with you. You may not have to change destinations. You may not be called into the ministry. You may not have to do something that you don't want to do. But I will call you. I will enable you. I will empower you to get off of the shore and get into the boat and do something great for the cause of Christ. There's a book called Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. And in that book, the premise of that book is find out where God is working and go there. When you see God doing something, don't just watch. Experience. Because when we are experiencing the very power of God, we can do some great things when we say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to go? Where should I do it? And we have the power of God within our life. We can experience great things. But the question is, are you complacent? I don't believe Peter, sitting on the shore, was complacent. I believe he was doing what he was supposed to do. He was mending his nets. He worked all night, and he was doing what a fisherman is supposed to do. He wasn't complacent. He was just doing his job. When we become complacent is when the job becomes more important than what God has asked us to do. And when we think mending the net... Or if we think going to church is more important than doing what the church has called us to do, then we've become complacent. What does that mean? Complacency is defined as showing smug or 
uncritical satisfaction with oneness or one's achievement. There's a fine line between being content and complacent. Contentment is a grateful attitude for what God has brought you and is bringing to you. I'm satisfied. I'm content. I'm, I'm doing what God wants me to do. I can be content in God's blessings. I can be content in doing God's work. I'm content when I'm serving God and somebody gives their life to Christ or somebody is being blessed in your ministry or somebody is doing what they're supposed to do. Contentment is saying, I am satisfied with what God is doing within my life. I'm serving him. I'm satisfied with him. He's doing things through me. I can be content. But complacent means I don't care. I can do what I want, when I want, how I want, and I don't care what anybody else tells me to do. I'm not. And whenever we become complacent, that boat is going to rock. And you may be able to put four paddles in the water, you may be able to hold on to that boat, but I guarantee you, if you're a child of God, you know what's going to happen sooner or later? He's going to get sick and tired of your fighting, and you are going to hit a brick wall, and that boat is going to capsize, and he is going to get your attention whether it's when the boat is upside down or that boat is rocking, he's going to say, I want you. And we're going to have to call out to him. We're going to call out to him in a big way. He's going to do it for your salvation. He died on the cross for all men to be saved. And once we have given our life to Christ, once we've experienced his power and his love and his forgiveness and his grace, we bowed our head before him and he has forgiven us of where we've been, where we are, and he's going to empower us to where we go. He saved us. And we can say thank you for that. If we can experience that forgiveness of God, it's the greatest forgiveness that we will ever experience. But doing is the greatest satisfaction that we'll ever experience. Doing. Getting off the shore. Quit mending our nets. And say, guys, I need your help. Peter said, dude, I can't do this on my own. I, I, I can't. God is here and, 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 and he's blessing us and I need your help. And they got right into their boat. They got right out to the shore and they did what Peter asked them to do. Their nets began to break and their ships began to sink because God's blessing upon Peter's life overflowed to his partner's life. So my challenge Let's not be complacent. Personally, what is it in your life, and we all have it, that you have flipped on the switch? I got a car that you push the button, and you put that on cruise control. You put your hand on the steering wheel, your feet just stuck back, and you're just cruising down life. You have to change lanes every once in a while. You may have to even tap the brake every once in a while because you're coming up on a car. But it's easy driving with a cruise control in it. Easy driving. Sometimes our Christian faith is on cruise control. Sometimes our life is on cruise control. And I believe more than anything else when it's on cruise control, that is when we make more mistakes because we're not engaged. That's when we do stupid things because we're not engaged. What in your life needs to get taken off of cruise control. And when you can answer that, that one question, I believe God will stop rocking the boat and he'll start putting sails up because we have to be self-aware of what we are not doing. Take it off cruise control and see what God can do. That's our challenge today.